Welcome to the Stanford Digital Economy Lab Lunch. I'm Eric Brynjolfsson, and today's seminar speaker is Hima Lakaraju. Hima is a professor at Harvard Business School and a faculty affiliate in computer science, data science, computation and society, and innovation science at Harvard. She teaches the core course on technology and operations management at HBS, and has also taught courses in artificial intelligence and machine learning and their real world implications. Hima's talk today will be, does model understanding improve human decision making? We welcome and encourage questions during the seminar. For those of you in the Zoom audience, please submit your questions using the Q&A function there at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. And for those of you here at Stanford in person, please just raise your hand and I'll call on you to ask a question. Uh, please be prepared to speak, uh, please be prepared to re repeat the question um, or speak clearly into a microphone so that people in the Zoom audience can hear the question. I think the way we'll organize it is uh, take any kind of clarification questions during Kima's talk for the first 45 minutes or so, and then say the last 10 or 15 minutes for a broader discussion of this topic. Kima, welcome to Stanford. Please tell us about model understanding and decision making. Uh, thank you so much for that lovely intro, Eric. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, all the audiences, both in person and on Zoom. Uh, nice to meet you all, and thanks so much for your time today. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll get started with today's talk. Okay. So the topic of today's talk, as I think we have seen in different forms by now, is does model understanding improve human decision making, right? Uh, so let me give a quick overview of the agenda for today before I go into the details. Uh, so I'll spend the first 10 to 15 minutes uh, giving a brief overview on what exactly do I mean by understanding machine learning models. And then I'll spend the next 30 minutes uh, thinking more about, you know, or discussing with you guys more about how model understanding can help real world decision making, or if and how it can, right? Uh, under that, we have split it into a couple of topics, counterfactual explanations and feature attribution based explanations. Don't worry, I'm going to go into the details of all of those and what are their implications for real world decision making, okay? All right, uh, so let's kick off the first piece, which is just getting a high level sense of what exactly I mean by model understanding, right? Uh, so I'm sure this is this crowd and also several of the folks on Zoom are not new to machine learning, right? So we have been seeing machine learning uh, being used or like, you know, sort of being sought after these days in several applications, including healthcare uh, and, you know, finance, you know, like loan approvals or like decisions on loan applications. And of course, several of our favorite online applications and web applications like Facebook, Amazon, Goodreads and so on, right? So basically machine learning models are everywhere today. Okay? Uh, so why should we care about understanding these models as opposed to just using them, right? So that's one of the critical questions. And in fact, several of the prior works have actually argued that model understanding becomes absolutely critical in several domains, especially those involving high stakes decisions, for example, healthcare, uh, or for example, loan decisions or things like these, right? So or screening resumes and so on. So why are people making that argument, right? Uh, so let's try and think about some of the use cases across different domains and then try to sort of convince ourselves how model understanding can even be helpful or like what is even the sort of motivation behind why there is so much, you know, hype and hoopla about let's try and understand what models are doing, right? Uh, so let's think about this simple example that you're seeing on screen. Uh, so let's say there is a buggy predictive model. That's why you see a bug on the predictive model, uh, which basically takes as input images and you know labels them, right? So in this case, the input is an image of a Siberian Husky. And if you see, the model has labeled it correctly as a Siberian Husky. But on deeper probing, what we see is that if you look at what are the features or the pixels in the image that the model is focusing on, it's actually focusing on the snow in the image, right? So clearly what we have built is a snow detector, not a husky detector, right? So after looking at what the model is focusing on, you know, the developer or the scientist who is working with this model can understand that it is relying on incorrect features to make this prediction and he or she has to fix this model, right? So in some sense, model understanding facilitates debugging, uh, which is of course a very critical use in several of the computer science sort of applications, right? 
Um, and the next thing, if we think of another, applica another application where there is a lone applicant and there is yet another buggy predictive model, in this case, the model's job is to ingest the details of loan applicants and output decisions about if their loans are denied or approved, right? And of course, there is a loan officer who is at the receiving end of these kinds of predictions, and they may also use their own discretion to determine what to do with these loan applications, right? So in this case, there is an applicant, the model says loan denied, upon further probing, uh, just checking what are the features that are most important to this model's prediction, what the loan officer notices is that race and gender are sort of showing up as the most important features. And you know that basically indicates that the model is relying on you know sort of biased features or incorrect features, and therefore he might have to make his own decision in this case, right? So in this case, model understanding has helped with bias detection. Okay? Um, and kind of flipping this picture around and looking at this from the loan applicant's perspective. So let's say there's a loan applicant and then you know she submitted her application and the model has rejected her application, the model that a bank is using. Instead of just telling her your application has been denied, if we can provide her with some kind of recourse, like for example, increase your salary by 50K or pay your credit card bills on time for the next three months, in order to sort of reapply and get a loan, if we are able to provide her with that kind of recourse, that would be a lot more helpful than just telling her your loan has been denied, sorry, right? In fact, things like these are being argued very sort of like rigorously by legislators and policy makers, and some of the legislations like GDPR like mention that this should be uh, sort of a given when we are using algorithms to make important decisions. Uh, and in this case, model understanding has helped provide recourse to the individual who has been adversely impacted by model predictions, right? And you know the list goes on and on. In this case, if, if we see a doctor here uh, who again has access to a predictive model, which basically ingests a bunch of patient records and then outputs predictions about whether patients are healthy or sick. Now, if we just give a list of predictions to doctors about different patients, again, they run into the same problem. They don't know how much to trust these models, which ones are correct, which, one, which predictions are wrong, when to rely on the model and not, right? But if I give the doctor a global understanding of what the model is doing here, which is, for example, if gender equal to female, then the model is relying on ID numbers, which is in yet another spurious features. But whereas for male uh, patients, the model is sort of relying on reasonable features like cold and cough, right? So in this case, the doctor can look at what the model is doing and realize that while she can trust the predictions of the model on male population, she cannot do so on the female population, right? Uh, so in this case, model understanding has helped the doctor assess if and when to trust model predictions when making decisions. Okay. Uh, and similarly, uh, there are authorities now like FDA whose approval is needed if we were to sort of deploy models in clinical decision making settings. Uh, and if they have this kind of an understanding of what the model is doing, then they can sort of determine if the model is ready to be deployed or not. Right? In this case, the model is basically using spurious features on, on female populations, which basically means it's not yet ready to be deployed since it is probably going to badly affect half the people. Right? Okay, so in this case, model understanding allows us to wet models to determine if they are suitable for deployment in the real world. Right? Uh, so essentially, we have thought about or talked about a bunch of use cases, uh, you know, in terms of utility, whether it's debugging, bias detection, recourse, determining if and when to trust model predictions, wetting models to assess suitability for deployment, and there are several stakeholders that can benefit from model understanding, right? Uh, from end users like loan applicants, or decision makers like doctors, regulatory agencies, researchers, and engineers, pretty much. The use cases uh, are unlimited and the stakeholders are also quite a few. Yes, sir? Hi, Hima. Can, can I help me understand um, how one interprets some of the models? So if it's, a, if it, it's an if-then rule system, you can have these uh, English-like logical yep. conditions, but a lot of machine learning systems have millions or hundreds of millions of parameters that might be much harder to right. in interpret. How do you map between those mathematical weights into things like um, what age we can or understand. gender or whatever. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. And that's what at least the next part of the talk is going to be about. Uh, so which is now that there are so many use cases or potential sort of positive implications of model understanding, how do we even go about doing it, right? Or what does literature suggest, okay? Yeah, so how do we achieve model understanding? That's like the right uh, next slide. Okay, so take one of this, right? So historically, what people have done, uh, so interpretability or model understanding has been a topic that has come to the fore at different points in time in machine learning and other relevant literatures. So the first take to this of how do we understand models is, build models that are inherently interpretable. What do I mean by that? For example, linear models, linear regressions, logistic regressions, shallow trees, you know, fewer rules as Eric was just pointing out. So these kinds of models, I'm sure we can all agree that we are able to look a peek a little bit into the model logic when our models look like this, right? So this one set of approaches that we could use if we care about understanding the models, right? Just in line with Eric's question. Now, the second take that has emerged in recent times is explain pre-built models, which could be complex, like complex neural networks with you know, millions of parameters in a post hoc manner. Right? So what do I mean by that? So here is a black box, either a model that we just don't have access to, we can basically just query it, or it's a very complex model, like a neural network with several hundreds of intermediate layers. Right. Uh, so in between, we build some explainer algorithms, and these algorithms break the complex model down yet again into simpler models with interpretable features. Right. Uh, so essentially think of it as you're trying to approximate the behavior of a complex model using several simpler models. Right. And each simpler model might help us understand the behavior of these complex models in one tiny part of the feature space. Okay, So that's how we could interpret it. Uh, and we'll go into a lot more detail into this. Uh, but, you know, sort of the question that we often get once we say there are two takes to understanding models is when would you use which one, right? So what is your take on should we use inherently interpretable models or should we explain complex models in a post hoc fashion, right? Uh, and this picture kind of summarizes the gist for my answer to that question. Uh, so if you see, there are several research works that have clearly showed that especially when your data is high dimensional or you have a ton of data, uh, different research works have demonstrated that complex models like deep neural nets achieve a much higher accuracy than simpler models like linear regression or decision trees and so on, right? So if you kind of plot this trade-off curve between interpretability and accuracy, while these models like you know, shallow decision trees or regressions rank high on the interpretability scale, they may not rank as high on the accuracy scale, right? So these trade-offs are exactly what motivated this entire literature on post hoc explanations of complex models, uh, again in line with the question we just got, right? In certain settings, and in the modern world, it's turning out to be quite a lot of settings, uh, these accuracy interpretability trade-offs are existing because of which we are forced to think about post hoc explaining models. So when to use which one? Again, right? So the answer to that question is, let's say one example is that if your data looks like this, it is almost linearly separable, not quite, but like almost, right? In this case, you will be able to build simpler models which are interpretable, uh, but those models are also likely to be quite accurate, right? So if your data looks like this. On the other hand, the real world data sets that we are dealing with today often look like this with pretty complex decision boundaries, in which case simpler models like linear fits uh, are not going to do the job in terms of accuracy and complex models are likely to fit this kind of a decision boundary better and achieve higher accuracy. So in that case, you might want to sort of consider the approach of build a complex model and explain it in a post hoc fashion. right? And sometimes you just don't have enough data to build your model from scratch, right? So you, you just can't train a model and all you're left with is some proprietary black box that somebody else has built. Even in that cases, you might want to at least probe that model and understand how it is behaving. Again, sort of a case for post hoc explanations, right? 
Uh, so in summary, as highlighted by some of the prior works, if you can build an interpretable model, which is also adequately accurate for your setting, maybe that's the route to go because you're avoiding one more level of approximation to understand what the model is doing, right? But otherwise, post hoc explanations come to the rescue and they help us peek into complex model behavior. Okay, all right. Okay, so this talk will focus quite a bit on post hoc explanations, uh, as you might have assumed as we are making a case for it so far. Okay. okay, so what is an explanation again in the context of post hoc explanations, right? So it has to provide some sort of an interpretable description of model behavior. What I mean by that is, let's say there is a complex classifier on this side, there is an end user on the other side. Uh, we are somehow trying to develop an interpretable description of the model, which should both be faithful to the model behavior, otherwise there is no point of giving an explanation which is not adequately capturing the underlying model behavior, but at the same time it should be understandable to the end user we are targeting. Right, And as we saw, there are several stakeholders ranging all the way from machine learning scientists and engineers to doctors and you know, law and policy makers. So depending on the sort of the domain expertise and ML expertise of the users, different things might be understandable to them, right? But faithfulness becomes equally important under all of those circumstances. And what could be some examples of these kinds of explanations, right? So one is if the users are ML researchers or scientists, maybe send all model parameters and you know they sort of can make sense of it. Does not work in a lot of cases where we are dealing with uh, experts in other domains. The second thing is maybe send many example predictions uh, or summarize the model behavior with simple rules entries around a particular point, right? or select most important features that are sort of, uh, that can be obtained by creating local approximations of complex models. I'll go into the details of all this in a bit, by the way, I'm just throwing out some options of what could be an explanation. And then the last one is maybe describe how to flip this model prediction, each prediction of a model, how can we flip the prediction or what features need to change in order to flip the prediction, right? So there are different kinds of ways of thinking about these explanations. Uh, and we will basically touch upon one class of explanations uh, and I'm going to talk about that a bit, right? So explanations can be broadly characterized into local and global. Local, as the name suggests, is you're trying to give an interpretable description of a model in a very small target neighborhood, typically in the vicinity of a particular data point, right? So essentially think of a local explanation as it is explaining how the model is arriving at one prediction, that individual prediction that we care about. Right? And global explanations, again, as the name suggests, are interpretable descriptions of complete uh, model behavior. So this can be thought of as a bird's eye view of model behavior. Right? Uh, so and in this talk, we'll focus on local post hoc explanations and more specifically, two classes of local post hoc explanations. Okay, uh, so any questions so far before we move on to the next topic? Yeah, one question just came in uh, from online. Um, and the question is, uh, what's your response to the likes of Cynthia Rudin, who says that the accuracy and interpretability of uh, the trade-off, the accuracy versus interpretability ugh, trade off is a myth and that we should stop trying to interpret black box models? Right. Uh, so I think there are two separate pieces to that point. One is accuracy, interpretability, trade-off is a myth, and the other is we should stop explaining black box models, right? Uh, so let me address the second one. I think I've already touched upon some of that when I discussed some of the earlier pieces where I said, if you can build an inherently interpretable model, which is also accurate for your setting, you should probably do it because you'll avoid one more level of approximation, right? But in a lot of real world settings, unfortunately, that's not the case. People want to build complex models because they're turning out to be accurate, right? Uh, and that all that sort of kind of pushes us into this territory of like, let's consider post hoc explanations. Now coming to the first part of accuracy, interpretability, trade-off is a myth. I think uh, there are several works that sort of 
emphasize this piece that, especially if you look at high dimensional data sets like vision or NLP or even the structured data, which is sort of we get tons of recommender system data these days. In all of those cases, I think deep learning models have like successfully bet several other simpler models. So that sort of indicates that there is a trade off there between a complex model being able to do well. That said, I think maybe the point I also want to qualify what uh, she said in her paper, which is that in some settings, accuracy interpretability trade-offs may not exist, right? So if you have like a small data set with like reasonably simple decision boundaries, you might be able to say that, yeah, this, this trade-off does not exist here. In such cases, then you don't have any problem. Right? So in some sense, I think sort of there is a space where post hoc explanations are helpful, and there is a space where interpretable models are helpful. So that's what we are trying to tease out in the past few minutes. Right? OK, great, thank you. Uh, so I'll move on to the next pieces of the talk. As I said, we'll focus on local explanations, which is how to think about the model behavior on individual instances. And under that, we'll focus on a couple of classes counterfactual explanations for algorithmic recourse, which will be our next topic, uh, and then feature attribution-based explanations for early detection of diseases in resume screen. Okay? So I'll start with this. So what do I mean by this? So there are, I guess, four different words at least that might be hinting at different things. So let me try to explain uh, with an example here. Right. So let's go back to our scenario of loan applications where there's an applicant who has sent his loan application to a bank and the bank employs a predictive model to determine if this application should be approved or not. Right. So in this case, for this applicant, the model thinks the loan should be denied. Instead of just saying this, uh, if we sort of leverage a recourse finding algorithm as an intermediary and also provide this applicant with a recourse, that can be pretty helpful to them, right? So for example, the recourse could be increase your salary by 50K and pay your credit card bills on time for next three months. In fact, that kind of what we are seeing as a recourse here is exactly what is referred to as a counterfactual explanation. Right, so counterfactual explanations tell us what features should be changed in order to flip the model prediction for a given instance in the data. Right, so these uh, kinds of explanations have become like hot favorites when we think about algorithmic recourse in real world, especially settings like loan applications or hiring or credit and all of these things. Right. Okay, so how do we generate such a recourse or such a counterfactual explanation? Right? So the intuition behind it is, let's look at this point X, which is on the negative side of the model's decision boundary. So this is the decision boundary of the model, and this is the model that has been deployed by the bank to make decisions about loans of people, right? And there's the negative side, all points here are getting zero, that's loan denied. And there's the positive side where all the points that fall here, their loans are approved, right? So X is a point here, which means his loan is denied, his or her loan is denied. Now, how to generate a recourse, the way current algorithms think about this problem is, take X and then sort of try and keep adding small amount of noise to it until we are able to push it across the decision boundary and then convert it into a positively labeled point, right? So for example, you can sort of nudge X a bit in this direction, and then you may end up with CF1, which is a counterfactual that will give them a positive outcome, or you may nudge X in this direction and end up with CF2, which is a counterfactual that will again give X a positive outcome, right? So now the proposed solutions in literature pretty much differ on the couple of principles, how to choose among the candidate counterfactuals, because as I said, you can either nudge X in this direction and get to CF1, or nudge X in this direction and get to CF2, right? And the second thing that a lot of solutions differ on is how much access is needed to the underlying predictive model. Uh, do these algorithms just need query access, which means throw a point at it and you get a label? Or do you need more deeper access, like maybe weights of the, you know, sort of the edges of the neural network, or typically they need gradients, which is the derivatives of the model, in order to sort of come up with these recourses, right? And the more information you have, the better the sort of quality of the recourses is the claim. 
Um, again, just to kind of highlight three different strategies that are being used to uh, come up with algorithmic recourse or counterfactual explanations. The first one is minimum distance counterfactual, which is find a point across the boundary which is closest to the original instance. Right, so you can think of it as L2 distance, L1 distance, you know, uh, any of these things, but essentially pick a metric and find a counterfactual that's closest to the original instance. The second one is feasible counterfactuals, which is don't just find a closest point according to some distance metric, but find low cost counterfactuals that are actually feasible. What do I mean by that is changes to race, gender, these kinds of things are not allowed. And sort of the notion of cost associated with a counterfactual is also coming in, which is, you know, it might be easier for a person to maybe change their salary than to sort of move to a different city, right? Uh, or like the vice versa, depending on like a person's uh, setup and so on. So think about the cost that it takes in order to act on a counterfactual for somebody and then find low cost counterfactuals that are actually feasible, no changes to uh, sort of attributes like uh, race or gender, right? And the last one is causally feasible counterfactuals, which means again, find either minimum distance or low cost counterfactuals, but those that are feasible according to structural causal models. Right, so in some sense, why the third approach is important is, uh, you know, let's say in the previous two approaches, we give a recourse to somebody that says, oh, come back with a master's degree and like you'll get a loan, right? So let's say if that's the recourse provided, uh, let's say a person does exactly that and then they come back and then, you know, they come back to the model and the model says, oops, sorry, I realized that your age increased by two years but I did not want that to happen. I only wanted you to get an education, right? So that change will sort of like changing education level without changing age will be prohibited if we consider causal constraints, right? Uh, yes, Eric. Uh, yeah, there's a, another question here from uh, Naveen uh, Gantala. Um, and uh, the question is, your analysis assumes that the algorithm stays consistent for a reasonable period of time for us to provide recourse to the users. What if the models change very rapidly? Yeah, that's a great point. And yes, that is that happens. And uh, that's exactly what I'm going to discuss next. Because in the real world, I think I love the questions today. They're, you guys are being nice to me. Uh, so yeah, so that's ex that is true. That's a big problem in the real world. And you know that's, that's something that we'll get to in just a couple of slides. Okay? All right, so, yeah. And I have another question about these, this taxonomy here. Um, is, it, is it possible that there may be some things that are low cost for one person and other things that are low cost for a different person? And so could, it, could you imagine it being personalized? Yeah, of course, that yeah, yeah. There's some things you might do and, and I might do something different. Ex yes, exactly, right? So for each person or at least for a subgroup of people, the cost might differ in terms of like what would be a desirable counterfactual for them. And some of our work uh, touches upon those problems. Okay. All right, so let's start with like the first important question, which is how useful are counterfactual explanations to loan applicants, right? So because, you know, machine learning literature and scientists and everybody is claiming that, oh, this will solve the problem of giving recourse to people who are negatively impacted by these decisions, especially in contexts like loan, how useful are they? Uh, to this end, we actually did a survey with 182 bank customers who have applied for loans in the past year. And roughly around 56% of them have successfully obta obtained loans and remaining were either denied loans or very asked very high interest rate, which they just could not afford. So they did not take the loans they requested for, right? Uh, so we actually conducted an online survey of these applicants, asking them various questions about utility and helpfulness of these counter factual explanations prescribed as recourses. Okay? A summary of some of the survey questions that we uh, ask them are the following, which is how helpful is a recourse prescribed in the form of a counterfactual explanation and on a scale of not helpful at all to extremely helpful? Uh, and would a recourse motivate you to change your circumstances and reapply for the same loan with the same bank? Again, strongly disagree to strongly agree. Uh, how would you feel if you implement the recourse and the bank still denies you the loan? for whatever reason, 
uh, and would you still do business with the same bank if this happens, right? And the last question, actually there are several questions, but some of the top questions that I wanted to share with you guys were, uh, would you expect the bank to give you a loan even if you fall slightly short of the prescribed recourse, right? So these were some of the key questions that we had several interesting answers to from people who are actually applying for loans uh, in the real world, right? So 93% of total participants said that a counterfactual explanation prescribed as a recourse would be helpful or extremely helpful. So that's an overwhelming number of people in that sample. And then 76% of total participants agreed or strongly agreed that a recourse would motivate them to act on it. In fact, this number increases to 81% with unsuccessful applicants who could not get a loan of their choice, right, of, of their desired interest rate. And then what we see is about 98% of total participants said that they would be very dissatisfied or at least dissatisfied if the bank denies a loan after they implement a recourse. If you give them a recourse and then for some reason say, sorry, we made a mistake, people just absolutely dislike it. And 83% of the participants said that they would never do business with the same bank again, which is uh, you know, something that's a pretty huge loss for the banks if that happens, right? And uh, lastly, 95% of participants agreed or strongly agreed that the bank should give them a loan even if they fall slightly short of the prescribed recourse. So instead of increasing their salary by 10K, if you were to do it by 9,500 or 9,800, 900, they feel that that's still reasonable and the bank should not deny them recourse for the $100 or $50, right? Uh, so this is a point which also ties to the question that was just asked by one of the participants, which is kind of a striking finding, right? So once the bank gives a recourse to somebody, uh, they cannot turn back. Uh, if they do, they are going to sort of incur the wrath of the customers or, you know, serious consequences. Uh, but that said, even without the bank's control, uh, there may be issues that could happen which might cause recourses to not work. Uh, due to some of the reasons related to machine learning, which is what we are going to talk about and try and fix, right? So what is the challenge with existing recourse algorithms? Recourse generated by existing algorithms, pretty much most of them or all of them, uh, is typically not valid when the underlying model changes, right? So because all these algorithms assume the underlying model remains the same and prescribe a recourse for that. If your decision boundary has changed or the model of change, there is no guarantee that you will still get a positive outcome when you implement a recourse, right? And as one of the audience members pointed out rightly, models are regularly updated in practice either because of data shift or retraining or and retraining induced by data shifts or audits of models when people check if they're being fair and so on may also lead to changes in models, right? So, and models can be updated not on a particular schedule, but like any time because that otherwise that can be a very problematic thing for the banks if they realize their model is being inaccurate and they just have to wait another six months to update the model. Right? So this is a very practical challenge with a lot, which a lot of literature does not exist. And that's one of our uh, new RIPS papers of last year, which was trying to address this challenge. Right? Uh, so the, there are two questions when we think about addressing this challenge. The first is, how do we characterize model shifts? I think uh, hopefully we have established by now that you know somebody who might have gotten a recourse, let's say this was a point or an individual who earlier fell into this negative space of the first model, let's say this is the first model, the blue line, uh, and then got a recourse that falls somewhere here, uh, and then the model changed to this black line, which means earlier this was positive, but now this is negative, right? So for such kind of a person or that kind of a scenario, what do we do is the question. And there are two key pieces to the solution. One is how do we even characterize a model model shifts, right? So what does a model shift even mean? So this answer can be sort of intuitively easy to think about when we think of linear models, right? So a linear model is basically a vector of coefficient. A shift to that model can be modeled as additive changes to the coefficients of these models, right? So that's one simple way to think about it. But that said, this can get complicated as you go to complicated models, 
and typically you can think of as long as you can express it in some kind of a vector of theta, we can capture changes to that in some way, right? So, and different alternatives are possible. One of the things that we used is we consider additive shifts to model parameters and they'll help us characterize that here is a change to the model. Right? So in doing so, of course, the solution is assuming that the model class is not changing, but it's the same class, but you know, the parameters are changing because people are retraining the same class. Right? And once we have a handle on how to characterize these model shifts, the next question is, how do we generate recourses that are robust to model shifts? Right? And the solution there is, earlier, if you were trying to sort of, if the loss function for generating the recourse was, uh, minimize the chance that the prediction of this underlying model will not be one for an implemented recourse, if that is the intuitive loss function, now your loss function changes to minimize the chance that the recourse does not lead to a negative outcome across a range of models. Right? So instead of looking at one model and trying to come up with a recourse, now you want a recourse that actually works for that model, but also like sort of shifts around that model, like additive shifts of the parameters of those models. Right? So in some sense, this can be formulated using a minimax optimization problem, which is actually something that you would find pretty commonly in adversarial machine learning literature. The idea is to minimize the worst case recourse loss across different possible model shifts, right? So don't just minimize the loss under one model, minimize the worst case loss under several possible model changes, right? Um, and we use uh, this adversarial training algorithms, which are again sort of uh, standard in adversarial ML literature to optimize it. And we also have some theory in this work that demonstrates that the recourses generated by our models are, are not significantly more costlier than the recourses generated by previous algorithms, which don't consider multiple models and recourse being robust to multiple models, right? So that's the sort of summary of this work. And we carried out experimental uh, results or you know, experimental evaluation with different data sets, one of them capturing correction shift, which is the data had some inconsistencies earlier and they fixed it. That's the German credit data. Other one capturing temporal shift, uh, which is the loan approval data from year one to year two, there was change in the data. The last one is geospatial shift, where it's student performance across different uh, states in the US. Right? So different kinds of shifts in the data will cause changes in the models, and that's what we were trying to capture. And as a summary, uh, what we found was that recourses generated by our framework are on an average across all three data sets about 74% more likely uh, to hold across model shifts, right? So that's a significant jump over uh, other algorithms. So this 73% or 74% improvement is relate, uh, relative to state of the art. Right? So that's one of the solutions for how you would think about uh, this problem of models are constantly updated, now what happens to recourses? Okay. So there is also another piece, which I don't think I have time to go into a lot of detail into, but essentially another thing that people mentioned in the survey was that uh, several of the participants agreed or strongly agreed that the bank should give them a loan, even if they fall slightly short of the prescribed recourse, right? Again, what some of our recent work, which is currently under review, deals with this problem. The first thing that we found was that, in fact, several state-of-the-art algorithms actually don't guarantee this. So if they say increase this by 10,000, if you don't do it exactly to that, sometimes even the monotonicity is not preserved, right? So you need to kind of be there at the dot, otherwise you might still sort of end up in the negative zone. Uh, and that's a problem, and that was being fixed by one of our recent works. Again, the intuition here is that uh, don't just give a recourse, give a recourse where you're ensuring that small shifts to that given recourse will still get a positive outcome from the model, right? So that's, that's how the objective function is sort of modeled. Uh, and efficiently solved using certain algorithms there. Okay. All right, great. Uh, so now let's move to the last part of this talk, and I'll spend about five to 10 minutes on this, uh, which is thinking about feature attribution-based explanations for early detection of diseases and resume screening. 
right? Uh, so this answers one of the direct questions that one of the questions that was asked earlier about if there is a complex model, explain to me very clearly how you would explain the predictions of such a model, right? And there's an algorithm called line that will, and there are of course several other follow-ups as well, uh, but there's a very intuitive algorithm. So I thought I would first discuss this. The idea here is that while, so the decision boundary that you see here is for a complex model. So here is the boundary of the model and one class is positive or rather negative and the other class is positive, right? The intuition is that while complex models have complex decision boundaries and are typically harder to explain globally, once you sort of zoom in into smaller pockets of the data, they have relatively simpler decision boundaries, right? So while this might be super non-linear at a global sort of a bird's eye view, if you look at this point here and zoom in here, you see that the model can be just modeled by a linear model, right? So this, this is essentially like a linear decision boundary. You can use a simpler model to capture the behavior of this complex model around the vicinity of this point. Right? So that intuition has been exploited by several works in recent literature, and a very simple algorithm which sort of exploits this uh, intuition is the following. What we do is sample points around Xi. So let's say that plus mark that you see is a point Xi. So you basically perturb that point slightly and sample a bunch of points around it so that you have like a local neighborhood around Xi. And once you have a bunch of points around Xi, use the underlying complex model to sort of label those points because we want to approximate that model and then weigh samples according to distance to Xi. So a point that is farther away gets less weight and the point that is closer to Xi gets more weight, right? Because that's what we want to model. And then once you have this kind of a setup, just fit a linear model, like a linear regression or a logistic regression to these points. And that will essentially give you like what are the features that are important for that particular prediction for the complex underlying model. Right? So there's a very simple idea. You're trying to approximate model behavior in that local neighborhood using like small uh, models or like simple linear models, right? Okay, so now using that technique and that tactic, uh, can we improve the accuracy of real world decisions using explanations that are generated uh, using this kind of an approach, right? So what we studied is a couple of things. So first is this prediction problem. The question here is we want to understand uh, if the accuracy of this kind of decision making can be improved using uh, this feature attribution based explanations. <coughs> So the problem here is, is a given patient likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer within the next two years, right? So it's an early detection problem, not a diagnosis problem. Uh, to this end, we carried out user studies with about 78 doctors uh, who are residents in internal medicine. Uh, and we basically did an online study with them. Again, none of this is actually live study on patients, just to be very clear. So these are simulated online studies where people are looking at historical data and trying to sort of pretend that that's the current data and make their predictions. Right? Uh, so what we did was each doctor looks at 10 patient records from historical data and make predictions on each of them about is this patient likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer or not. Right? And we, in, in the next two years or not. Okay? So we kind of divided these doctors into three buckets uh, and doctors were randomly assigned to one of the three buckets. What are the three buckets? The first bucket just had doctor looking at the data of the patient and then determining is this patient likely to uh, you know, be diagnosed with breast cancer or not. And we measured the accuracy of the setup. It was about 78%, so, right? So that's the human only decision that we are making. And the second uh, bunch or group of doctors, they had access to the model's prediction as well as the probability for each point that they look at. Right, So they don't just have their own uh, sort of discretion or decision making power, they can look at this label. For example, in this case, you know, somebody is at risk of being diagnosed with a probability of 0.91. Right? In that case, the accuracy of the overall decision making uh, turns out to be sorry, about 82%. 
right? So I also want to show that the model accuracy itself in this case was about 89%. Uh, so interestingly, when we put the doctors and the predictions together, their accuracy didn't really match up much to, I mean, it's still in the vicinity, but there is still like absolute points of like about six to seven point gap, right? Now the third case is there is a doctor uh, there is the model prediction and the probability, but there is also a list of the important features that we obtained using the explanation method that we just talked about in the previous slide, right? So we just show that these are the three, four features, the top three, four features that the model is using when making this prediction. Uh, so the doctor has access to all of those pieces of information. In this case, the accuracy turned out to be much higher than even the model's accuracy because doctors now were sort of using those explanations to judge whether they could rely on the model or not, right, uh, for a particular prediction. So in this case, obviously, the example that I'm showing, you see that the important features are ESR, which is uh, sedimentation rate, which is a marker of inflammation. Uh, and family risk of, you know, this disease, breast cancer, and other chronic health conditions. Those are the important features that the model is using for this prediction, which seems pretty reasonable, right? But in another example, uh, we also saw that the model is using features like appointment time, appointment date, uh, zip code, and doctor's ID when determining what will happen. And in that case, obviously, the doctor would ignore the recommendation of the model and make their own prediction, right? So it helped them calibrate how much to rely on the model predictions. Right? Yeah. I think the point you're just making relates a little bit to a question that we've had here in the, in the Q&A from uh, Benoit Monin. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the accuracy interpretability trade-off, in human psychology, we learned that a lot of identity I learned a lot by identifying predictable mistakes that humans make, for instance, visual illusions or heuristics research, without implying that these mental shortcuts should never be relied on. Similarly, is there value in letting the models make more mistakes, mm -hmm. i.e. lower accuracy, if it gives us greater insight onto uh, where and in what neighborhood not to use them, and insights into how they make their decisions to get it right? Yeah. I think it's a little similar to what you're saying. Right. You yeah, no, that's a, a interesting point. I think that question is also touching upon while we are now dealing in the space of explanations of models, I think that question is also asking a more fundamental question of is there value in sacrificing accuracy and building a simpler model if that is at least sort of telling me what it is doing so that then I decide whether to go with it or not. Right, because right. then the humans can be more useful if it's just yeah. a black box and they know it's right 82% of the time, but which 82%? Right, exactly. Versus if it's right so, 75%, but they know yeah. when it's working. Right. In fact, I think this could be a good middle ground for what the, uh, you know, the audience member is asking, because in this case, you can keep your model to be accurate, but by sort of explaining the predictions, individual predictions of these models, doctors can look at what are the important features the model is using in each case, and then determine whether they should trust this particular prediction or like they should make their own decision, right? So it's probably the best of both worlds. It really gets to the point you're, you, why you're, you know, your research is important is that these models mostly aren't used just to meant to be a, a totally autonomous system you yep. turn on and walk yep. away from. Almost always there's humans in the loop or humans right. have to make yeah. judgments. So you really should be optimizing not the model, but the model plus the human together. Exactly, right, the combined decision-making process. That's, right. yeah, that's that exactly requires right. some level of interpretation. Well, yeah. Presumably, interpretability will help with right. that. Right, yeah, yeah. That's exactly one of the big reasons, I guess, for the push for interpretability, right? So I want to caveat this a little bit by saying that it's important to ensure that your explanations themselves are correct to begin with, because if that is not in place, then I think you're inducing just more errors into this process, right? So we are also doing some studies in terms of what if we sort of experiment with different levels of accuracy of the explanation that we give to the doctors, and our preliminary results are suggesting that that is not going to work. So this is this kind of a result is sort of holding only when your explanations are doing the job that they're supposed to do well, which is correctly uh, get to the important features the model is relying on for making this prediction, right? So I just wanted to mention that important piece. 
And uh, yeah, so the last kind of set of results that I wanted to sort of highlight on for just a couple of minutes is, now we have asked the question, can we improve the accuracy of decision making using you know, feature attribution based explanations, right? Now the next question is, can we reduce biases in decisions using feature attribution based explanations and fair machine learning models? So for this, we do a kind of a similar slash relevant task. What we, the setting that we look at here is screening resumes for hiring, okay? Uh, so basically the task is a recruiter looks at a CV or a resume and tries to come up with this decision of should a given candidate be considered for an interview for a software engineer position, right? So this is not replacing any of the interview process. This is just looking at the resume and saying, should I send this person to interview or not, right? Um, and that's a setting for which like automation is being used quite heavily in like several companies. Of course, there are some ethical issues and other things there, uh, which have been discussed at length in media and research and so on. But we are just considering this task because this is something that has been done by other companies in the past, right? And here we carried out some user studies with about 92 recruiters. Uh, and each recruiter's job is they look at 10 resumes. Again, this is an online study, it's a simulation, this is not affecting any real people in the real world, okay? Uh, so each recruiter looks at 10 resumes and makes an independent decision for each candidate independently, uh, which is basically, should I send this person with this CV to interview or not, right? Um, and what we did was we basically took identical resumes and then we just swapped the names from different genders, right? Same resume, a commonly used US male name, same resume, commonly used US female name. And by that rationale, probability of selection should be the same for both uh, males and females, right? Because we are doing independent selection, there are no constraints on slots or positions, right? Again, we divided this into three cases, and uh, uh, sorry, these uh, uh, people ignored that this thing, but that symbol basically stands for like a recruiter, right? So each recruit again, each recruiter gets into one of the three buckets, um, and what we observe is that in the first bucket, it's just the recruiter making the decision, okay? Uh, and the gap in the selection probability between males and females turns out to be 0.32, which is actually pretty high. This, this gap is essentially the probability that a male candidate gets selected minus the probability that a female candidate gets selected or the difference between those two essentially, right? So that gap is huge. And in our second case, what we do is there's a recruiter, uh, but the recruiter now has access to the label from the model and then the probability uh, of the you know model, the probability of the prediction by the model. And in this case, uh, what we did was the model that we trained here itself was optimized to be fair. First of all, because the model was trained, the names were removed and the model was trained on them, but we also checked that the gap in selection selection probability for the model is 0 0.01, which is a very small number compared to 0 0.32. So now when we put the recruiter together with the model and its prediction, we observe that the gap in that selection probability reduces a little bit. Uh, it goes from 0 0.32 to 0 0.29, some jump, not too much, right? Uh, the third case is again recruiter, model prediction, the probability of the prediction, and now we basically have the important features, which is coming from the explanation. Uh, for example, things like GPA or like number of GitHub repos, internships, and so on. And the gap in the selection probability has fallen quite drastically uh, from the other two cases, right? So it went from 0.32 and 0.29 to 0 0.05. It's still a little bit higher than the model's gap selection, a uh, gap in selection probability, which was 0 0.01 it's 0 0.05, but like it's getting there. In some sense, that gap has reduced, right? Yeah. Right, this seems like a possible answer to one of the other questions in here I'll just bring up. Apostol Vasilev uh, says that practice has shown that experts like doctors often have trouble overriding a model's predictions depending on whether the doctor's perception of how accurate uh, the model is. So right. maybe that's kind of similar to case two there and case three is yeah, the way around yeah, that. Yeah, exactly, right. So I think one of the things that we observed was that especially, I think I'll probably talk a little bit more about the previous case, we observed that when we put a model in front of uh, these resident doctors, 
uh, they have their own sort of predispositions towards how much they think the model is likely to work or not. I mean, of course, they all see the accuracy numbers, but they also have their own priors about, oh, this model will work great, so I'm just going to either completely agree with it, or some people saying, no, I don't trust models, so I'm going to like, you know, sort of dissociate myself with all the predictions that are happening here, right? So I think in that tussle, somehow we are not even getting as much improvement as we might get if we just use the model standalone. Right, so that's the, but whereas sort of supplementing these predictions with some information about the deeper understanding of what the model is doing is creating an effect both in terms of the improving the accuracy of the decision making as well as reducing uh, biases in decision making process, at least relative to human decision making in this case, right? Okay, yeah. Uh, so in this case, what we have seen is that understanding the rationale behind the prediction may be acting as a behavioral nudge. When we actually followed up with the recruiters and asked them, okay, so what, what does it feel like when you have a model and the prediction in front of you? And they actually said this thing, which was very illuminating, especially the people who saw the explanations, was that they were like, oh, when I saw the explanation, it felt like I was kind of reasoning with a colleague who had their own reasons to select this person, right? So it was almost like another entity trying to tell me, I'm making this decision because, you know, this female applicant or candidate has, you know, a lot more GitHub repos than this other candidate you're looking at. So why are you not thinking about it? Right, so especially features like stars on GitHub repos, number of GitHub repos started getting flagged here as important features. And I think that was what uh, people were sort of like becoming cognizant to that uh, fact when looking at some of the female applicants and that's what was reducing the bias a bit. Okay. All right, so with that, we have sort of powered through this uh, quite a bit and thanks so much for your patience and staying with me. I just wanted to end with some conclusions and happy to take more questions after that. Uh, so in the recent years, model understanding has emerged or rather re-emerged uh, as one of the most sought after topics in machine learning. Uh, if done right, uh, this can be very helpful in probing deeper into model behavior beyond just predictions and probabilities and confidences, right? Uh, it's very important to pay attention to quantifying the correctness or accuracy of model explanations. Otherwise, we might just end up trusting and deploying models with undesirable biases. If your explanations are wrong in the first place and you're trusting models based on them, so you might get bad results if the explanation itself is not correct, right? And this is definitely a nascent field. Uh, lots of scope for new research in terms of understanding utility of the methods that we have, of the explanations that we have, and also improving the reliability of existing methods and or are fundamentally rethinking the design of existing explainability methods, right? So with that, I would like to uh, thank you all and just flash the slide in case you want to reach out with more questions, but I'm also happy to take any questions if we still have time. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Hima. And let me just first see if there's any questions in the room here. Uh, no? Okay, there are some questions online, so let me uh, start with one. This is a, a very specific question, but maybe make it to launch it to a broader point. Uh, earlier, you said, like, that if one of the uh, factors variables was zip code, you would disregard that. Uh, the person asked, why? Why disregard the zip code? Which I guess leads me to ask a broader question. You know, what is it? Maybe it depends a bit on whether you have a predictive model or a causal model. Yep. Maybe if you're searching for uh, lead poisoning, um, zip code would be important. Right. And, yeah. and so maybe you can say more about which factors to include yeah so that is a question that basically has very domain specific answers because in that particular case uh, the fact that i think it was using few features like appointment date and time uh, and i think zip code was the fourth one or something uh, i think the more undesirable features were like appointment date and time and so on because that could potentially be because there are certain doctors who are specializing in certain cases that are likely to have to be checked and so on, and they're associated more with like positive, uh, you know, detections of like early diagnosis, uh, but their times and dates might change, right? Like, I mean, they might be on some schedule in the data, but like next, you know, 
the sort of season changes and their schedule could change. So that's why that's more of a spurious feature. Uh, so I think that's what I was referring to. But zip code in this case, I think it could potentially go either way. I guess in some cases, as you said, you know, it might be important. In some cases, maybe not. But I think the focus was more on the appointment dates and times. I mean, it does raise a kind of interesting idea that in some ways this could be used in reverse. Maybe there's something that we thought was spurious, but then you see that it's really important. And it might be worth pausing and thinking, well, true. is there some reason that judges give harsher sentences yeah. right before lunch versus after yeah. lunch? It seems spurious, but, but that it's related is to predictive. their blood sugar and their whatever. And so yeah. it kind of could drive researchers to, to go back and take a second look right. at understanding better. For sure. So I think even when the explanations sort of throw out spurious features, while you know, people might realize that, oh, this is likely to change because, you know, this is not a feature to anchor our predictions on. It's also indicating to them that this is what they're seeing in the data or this is what the model is seeing in the data, right? So I think that observation itself can be very useful, even if you decide not to trust the model on those predictions, but that observation can be very useful. Let me come back to a question I started to ask earlier on, which is part of the power of machine learning systems is they can absorb enormous amounts of data and have millions, hundreds of millions of parameters and, and frankly understand all sorts of things that I could never understand, most humans could never understand. Yeah. And for, as the models get more and more sophisticated and complex, is it going to become harder and harder for them to explain to lowly humans why they're making their decisions? I mean, they can simplify it the way, you know, um, Einstein could explain relativity to a three-year-old, but sure. we would it's kind of process. miss a lot of the points. Right. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think even when we try to sort of like, you know, the algorithm that I showed, which was line, there we are almost trying to use linear models to approximate the behavior of a complex model locally by saying that, oh, if I zoom in locally enough, the model might just have a line as a decision boundary when it tries to separate the two classes, right? Uh, but that assumption may not always be true as, again, as Eric, you're pointing out, as models become more and more complex. So in some sense, this is a simpler approximation of a complex decision boundary. And I think we are making assumption that the underlying decision boundary could be simple. But yeah, so there is also some work that we are doing in terms of like sort of improving the way we learn the models itself so that it can organically lend itself to be explained to people in a more correct way. So hopefully that will also address some of the concerns that you're raising, Eric. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Hima. This is really important work and appreciate you Thank coming you. to share some of your insights with us today. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for your time. And I'm afraid we're out of time, but uh, next week we're going to have Stuart Russell from Berkeley coming and talking about uh, what happens if we succeed with AI? So join us next week. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh,